I'm honored to uh, uh, be interviewing uh, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who was the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services in uh, the uh, George H.W. Bush administration from 1989 to 1993. But more than that, Dr. Sullivan is simply a wonderful person. I'm Dr. Alan Blum. I was asked by the uh, cancer letter and in particular, Alex Carolyn, who edits the um, Cancer History Project, wondered if I might uh, interview uh, Dr. Sullivan for uh, a podcast that we're going to issue uh, for the 60th anniversary of the release of the Surgeon General's Report on Smoking and Health by Dr. Luther Terry, who was from Alabama. And so that's the connection that I have for the University of Alabama Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society, along with Mickey Lemater, who was a... Uh, an alumnus of this university, and um, you could say that Alabama had uh, was the only state that had two uh, individuals on that uh, report. So I wanted to first explore your own thoughts about this anniversary, uh, since you played perhaps one of the most significant roles in furthering this issue, along with, uh, of course, Dr. Terry, uh, Dr. Coop, and and I would put, I, and yourself, I, I'd say that's, and then, of course, Julius Richmond, who was the Secretary of Health, who was so great, and then Joe Califano. I think those are the names that one thinks of in the government that took those risks to say, this is so important, we've got to stand up for this issue. Right. It was very important, uh, and I certainly was quite um, impressed by that report when it came out. Uh, because my own personal circumstances were as follows. I grew up in southwest Georgia, though, having been born here in Atlanta. And my father actually uh, was a uh, funeral director. But we had a little confectionery. Uh, and uh, I would frequently be minding the store. And I remember back in those years, back in the 40s and 50s, many advertisements were out such as there are more doctors smoking camels or lucky strikes were the favorite cigarette of doctors so those uh cigarettes at that time were being promoted uh as really uh, desirable objects that were being used by by doctors so when the surgeon general's report came out in 1964 pointing out that these the individuals who smoked had a higher incidence of uh, illness and death from lung cancer. That was very striking. So that is something that stayed with me the whole time because I had graduated from medical school in 1958. And so I was very much into health issues. And so the Surgeon General's report, I thought, was very important got a lot of attention, uh, really uh, turned the whole picture around, uh, showing that this was not a harmless hobby, but ra rather a very danger uh, to one's health and longevity. You know, it's, it's very interesting that I just realized you were an eyewitness to the release of the report. I was a high school senior uh, and I wrote my first uh, editorial uh, on smoking in 1964. My father handed me a copy of the Journal of the American Medical Association with an editorial uh, called Childish Habit, I believe. And I wrote the same title, but I adapted it for my own newspaper. But th this was the report. And and you were there. You had graduated from uh, Boston University School of Medicine after having been a magna cum laude graduate at, at Morehouse. Um, you epitomize the values and the greatness of Morehouse. And I, I want to come back to that in just a minute. But uh, um, what, a, what an incredible uh, bio to read about you. We all think of you as Secretary of Health, but we I hadn't realized uh, the depth of, of what you had done prior to that. And um, you founded a medical school. I was at Emory when, when Morehouse was just in its infancy. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 75. And I watched the, the growth. My uncle, uh, Marvin Goldstein and, and another uncle, Irving Goldstein were, were contributors in Atlanta to various, uh, organizations. Uh, one was the Ben Massell Dental Clinic and they were very, very interested uh, in Morehouse. Um, the, um, it, it's, it's just fantastic to see how that college, which has 
is separate from the university, but has, has become one of the, the most, uh, one of the foremost medical schools, not just for minority physicians, but for uh, the healthcare of Atlanta. Well, um, I knew Dr. Goldstein, and he was very generous uh, as one of our financial supporters, as well as uh, someone who gave us a lot of encouragement um, for the medical school. So that's very interesting. I That really was very exciting time, very challenging, but we had a lot of supporters like Dr. Goldstein and others who worked with us. Yeah, it was when I first gave a talk at, at Morehouse on smoking, it was absolutely a, a, a great moment to walk into that building and, and, um, because I think at the time that hadn't been named the, the road that you take from Tuscaloosa to, excuse me, uh, to the road now that you take from Tuscaloosa to uh, Atlanta goes past the Hamilton Holmes uh, Parkway. And Hamilton Holmes was my uh, orthopedic upper level. And mm. I did not know about him. I just thought he was this incredible teacher. Only mm. after I did my two weeks under his tutelage did people say, you had Hamilton Holmes. Oh, my gosh. And, and they explained who he, his significance as, as having been the, the pioneer at the University of Georgia and withstanding all the, the abuse that he had to, um, integrate that, that university. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of cross currents here, but mm-hmm. I think that, uh, um, as a witness to this report, as I was, um, I, I wonder if, if you could comment, because by the time you graduated, you went on to, uh, to being a resident in, at Cornell in, in New York, and then uh, you were a fellow in hematology, um, and and did that. Uh, but what was 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 there any scuttlebutt about this report? Did did you sense that physicians were taking the uh, uh, this issue seriously and going to do more? Because my father did, but but my father had had a heart attack. Uh, in his 40s, and that's what got him angry about smoking. He smoked two packs a day of Chesterfield that he started in medical school. But I wondered uh, whether, in your experience uh, in Boston, in New York, uh, was this uh, an issue that uh, people cared about? Well, it did become uh, quite an issue uh, that um, doctors did talk about it quite a bit uh, because uh, the image that the tobacco industry had promoted prior to that time was that this was a very sophisticated hobby that uh, it showed one's um, uh, level of um, acceptance uh, socially. And they really painted a picture that um, uh, people who were uh, indeed uh, uh, at the top of uh, the uh, social ladder really frequently were, were smokers. So, so this really did uh caused quite a bit of commentary uh and i i remember uh, for example uh when i um <clears throat> started at cornell um uh i applied for an internship there there had never been um a graduate of boston university in the program training program there and they had never had an african american intern uh, there. Uh, So when I went there for an interview, uh, after the first interview, I was asked to say to meet the chairman of the department. And I was quite pleasantly surprised, because I hadn't anticipated that I would be accepted. And when I went in, and I didn't even know who, who the chairman of medicine was. But when they showed me into his office, about an hour after my first interview, Turns out there was a a haze of smoke that came into the waiting room when they opened the door into the chairman's office. He was a cardiologist. His name was E. Hu Lucky. Uh, and of course, this was a new experience. And of course, I was very surprised uh, at the haze of smoke that, that came out. Uh, and I know this was something that the I and the other interns talked about because uh, we were really uh, quite impressed by that. So when the report came a few years later, this reinforced it. So so it really was the report that got a lot of attention. Uh, it was talked about quite a bit. 
it promoted uh, a lot of uh, research uh, that built upon the Surgeon General's uh, report of 64, uh, showing, of course, cancer in other organs, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, fibrosis, et, et cetera. So it really was, uh, for me at that time, a very, um, uh, it was a change agent uh, and it discussed a lot of work and stimulated a, a, a lot of work, yes. When you were in New York, by any chance across the street at Sloan Kettering, did you ever run into one of the only individuals in that era who was actively speaking out on smoking, which was Bill Cahan, the chest surgeon at Sloan Kettering? I don't recall meeting him, uh, so I, I don't. Yeah, he. Uh, I, I knew Bill very well in, in the 1980s and 1990s, and uh, he he just was uh, was terrific. It, it, even at Sloan Kettering, they were not. Uh, Ernst Winder uh, was doing work on, uh, well, <laughs> trying to develop a safer cigarette. Uh, but um, really, there were very few we would even call activists uh, in that era. Mm -hmm. um, but I know too that the American Medical Association uh, was a big disappointment. They uh, accepted, um, uh, well, up up to uh, initially five million dollars, and then a total of eighteen million dollars between sixty four and eighty and seventy eight to continue to study the issue. They they were the only health organization that did not endorse the report. Um, it, it's just it's mind boggling. Right. Well, I can I can share with you that. In 1975, I came back to Atlanta to develop the Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, and one of the people we recruited for our board of trustees for the medical school uh, was um, uh, in the advertising business. Uh, and he promised that he would get us support for the school from the tobacco industry. <laughs> and I remember telling him, oh, no, uh, don't do that. We are not interested. We don't want that. And so I know that in 1975, 11 years after the Surgeon General's report, uh, the reaction towards tobacco use was sufficient at that time that I felt that it would be very inappropriate for a medical school training doctors to be getting support from uh, tobacco the industry. So we, we never got, got that because my trustee really didn't at the time didn't see the harm from that but you, i said no that we would not have any scientific integrity if we were to accept uh, tobacco uh, funding and we wanted to be sure that our graduates not only uh, had a good knowledge base but also had a strong a sense of uh, of ethics uh, and um, character and interest in their uh, patients so that they would be working to encourage their patients to adopt healthy lifestyles. So that was another measure of the impact of the Surgeon General's report uh, some 11 years later as we were starting the new medical school. You may have been more alone than you think because uh, I can think of very few medical schools or even hospitals that were still not accepting or had no policy against accepting such money. For instance, MD Anderson uh, Cancer Institute in in, um, in Houston did not even divest its tobacco stocks until the late 1990s. Um, they did not even go smoke free until the 1990s. Um, it's it's astounding, uh, and I think all of the major medical schools in New York City were still they still had researchers who were taking funds from uh, what was called the Council for Tobacco Research. And this is one of my gripes, is that the Surgeon General's report had 7,000 papers to look through. And that's what the advisory committee did. And uh, by 1985, Dr. Koop said, well, now we have 50,000 papers. Uh, I don't think we need to more, do more proof because the industry was kept saying we need more research. And mm -hmm. today, when I wrote in The Lancet two years ago, uh, a, a, an article called... Um, tobacco control, all research, no action. Um, there I counted by a, a search on online, uh, Google Scholar, that there are now over 356,000 papers on tobacco. I, mean, I think at some point, uh, the research gambit 
um, should have played itself out when it came to taking action on tobacco. And Dr. Cahan had a very fierce debate, which we have on our website um, for the center, between him and Dr. Uh, and John Bradamus, who had been the congressman who became the head of New York University, mm -hmm. over the naming of the biggest hospital at NYU, uh, Tisch Hospital, named after the Tisch family, Mm -hmm. who uh, owned Laurel Art Tobacco Company. Mm -hmm. So we have Bowman Gray, which was named after an executive of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. We have Duke, founded by the Duke Tobacco Fortune. And believe it or not, as late as 2018 or 19, uh, Meharry uh, took uh, funding from Juul, the electronic cigarette manufacturer, to do more research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think you were you were not only uh, ahead of the crowd. I think you may have been literally alone, in especially as a new medical school, in turning down that largesse. Well, one of the other things that um, uh, happened in retrospect, thinking about this, in our early years, uh, I was uh, visited by a psychiatrist friend from New York, uh, who brought uh, while he visited me. He gave me a supply of lapel pins uh, with uh, the logo uh, saying tobacco smoking is inhibited. So I wore that all the time. And it, it, as it turns out uh, that when I was nominated to be Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, I visited members of the Senate Committee that would be involved in confirming my appointment as secretary. One of those people was Je Senator Jesse Helms <laughs> uh, there, uh, in North Carolina. So when I visited him, uh, I had, first of all, all of the visits that I made, uh, which were monitored and helped by Alan Simpson, Senator I from Wyoming. Mm -hmm. He was um, the, um, uh, majority whip at, at the time. Um, well, when I visited Senator Helms, uh, he noted my lapel pin. And of course, he uh, made it very clear that uh, he objected to that. And even in 1989, he was making statements such as, there's really no real proof that tobacco really uh, causes cancer. Uh, and what is it about you that makes you think that you uh, really uh, have the qualifications to be secretary? Uh, and uh, uh, with the discussion we had, now I indicated to him that if I were confirmed uh, as secretary, among the things I would be doing would be urging people to uh, improve their lifestyles. And one of the main things uh, that I would be urging they do to improve their uh, lifestyles was to stop smoking because of a large number of deaths and the injuries and illness uh, caused by, by tobacco. Uh, and of course, with tobacco being a major crop from North Carolina, he disagreed with that. And when I left his office, I knew that I did not have his vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sure enough, my confirmation vote was 98 to 1. <laughs> uh, and of course, that one vote was Jesse Helms. You should be very proud. Oh, yes. I said to my friends in Atlanta, had I gotten the vote from Jesse Helms, I would have had a lot of explaining to do as to why he was supporting me. So... And so at any rate, um, that was the one experience. So it was really um, shows that as, it wasn't that long ago that the tobacco industry uh, marshaled a lot of support, and they still have that lingering uh, uh, support. And unfortunately, too many um, organizations accept uh, funds from the tobacco industry, uh, and you mentioned the support that Meharry has received. Uh, I, when that happened, I had quiet conversations with my colleagues at Meharry, urging that they send the money 
fact because I explained to them that they, the tobacco industry would use that connection to try and give some legitimacy uh, to their arguments that uh, t- tobacco was not as harmful uh, as it really, uh, really is. So it has been a major challenge um, uh, o- over the years. And it shows how difficult it can be to change people's behavior. We see it in other areas, such as the vaccine uh, hesitancy that we have now among our population. The title of the exhibition that I'm completing with my colleague uh, Bryce Callahan, uh, The um, Lost Legacy of the Surgeon General's Report, has a quote at the top, um, uh, the most addictive thing about tobacco is the money. And this was quoted by my uh, colleague, Dr. Ed Anselm, an internist and a managed care uh, executive in, in New York City, who has worked with me for, we've worked together for 40 years. And he was struck not just by the uh, dependence of the tobacco industry on, on money, but by the dependence of the health community on, 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 I have a grant, therefore I exist. They really would rather study the issue than act on it. But you, you did more than that. And, and I appreciate your, your, your sharing the observation about both Jesse Helms and, and about Meharry. Uh, the, there was a congressman at the time, you may remember Thomas Bliley from Virginia, and they used to call him the, the congressman from Philip Morris. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was, it was extraordinary. Uh, people don't realize the extent of the power of the industry when, I was uh, I, I was fired as editor of the New York State Journal of Medicine after three years and producing two theme issues on the tobacco issue, the first that had been published. And I knew that the uh, lobby of the tobacco industry in Albany was pretty close with the lobby for the uh, medical society. Uh, I don't think that that was proven that they actually had anything to do with my firing. But uh, I, I do feel that it was a, it was a sad day when I was I walked in and was told to get out after the medical society had uh, commended me on my bringing this to the public's attention. But um, I I was told when I got a new job at Baylor College of Medicine that maybe I ought to get into something more socially acceptable in my research, like cocaine. I mean that that was actually a quote from a dean because they were so afraid that my activism would would offend the tobacco industry on the hill but uh, the other interesting moment was when i led my group of activists uh to protest the marlboro country music festival in houston we pulled up to in our in our vehicles to the outside of this event and we saw other picketers going around and we said hey wait a minute we were supposed to pick it what are you doing it was the act up people protesting against jesse helms so mm-hmm. we talked and we agreed that we were going to join each other's picket line to protest uh, the Marlboro Country Music Festival in Houston. Mm, right, right. The, um, you know, it's, it's, um, interesting that you picked up on something, uh, that made national attention that brought, uh, that, that you were outspoken. I don't know whether you did this with the approval of the administration, but, uh, you were especially upset about not just the introduction of a brand called Uptown, clearly aimed at minority populations, it was test marketed in Philadelphia, and Reverend Jesse Brown had led this uh, cry uh, against, "What do you? Why do you keep targeting us? And you're putting up billboards in our neighborhoods. You don't go out to the suburbs and do that." And just a wonderful person, you joined that call against R.J. Reynolds, and you also took it upon yourself to call for an end to tobacco sponsorship of sports. How about a little background to that? Yes, well, that happened. Um uh, in 1990, uh, I had um, uh, a trip to the Middle East, two weeks um, uh, there in the Middle East, a week in Egypt and a week in uh, Israel. Uh, the official uh, reason for that trip was to review research that the U.S. was supporting uh, in those two countries. Uh, on such things as um, uh, mosquito control, et cetera, in terms of malaria. Uh, and uh, But underneath uh, th- this r- work that we were reviewing was really the effort to get these countries to work together. So th- this was a mechanism that we were u- using. So on the way back uh, from um, the Middle East, 
um, and my wife was with me, uh, we stopped uh, in Rome and visited the Vatican. Uh, and, and then as we came from Rome back to the U.S., turns out the International Herald Tribune on the plane had this article about the um, community in Philadelphia objecting to R.J. Reynolds' plans to introduce this new cigarette uh, in the community called Uptown. That was the first I had heard about it. So I read the article, and it so happened that one week later, I was scheduled to be in Philadelphia, speaking at the University of Pennsylvania at the dedication of a new research building that had been built in part with uh, grant funds from NIH. So I told my wife, you know, when I go up there, I'm going to really uh, pull out all the stops. And I was outraged. The next morning at my eight o'clock meeting with my senior staff, I came in and put this newspaper on the table in front of me and asked, does anyone know anything about this? Everyone in the room started smiling. I then said, what's so funny? Well, what was funny was they had been busy talking to each other while I was away, figuring out what, how could they convince me to really speak out uh, against that, uh, that plan. So um, the procedures that we followed uh, in making uh, public uh, talks would be to send over to the White House several days before the event, copy of the speech, so that we would see that the Secretary of Education was uh, speaking it, uh, about things that really didn't conflict with what Secretary of Health or Secretary of Labor uh, uh, would, would, be, would be saying. And so I understood that because we wanted to be sure that the administration was very clear in what our positions were, et, et cetera. Uh, but I told my staff, now on next Wednesday, this was Wednesday, uh, I was to speak in Philadelphia, send my speech over at eight o'clock Wednesday morning. And I was speaking at 10 o'clock. So um, I knew very well that by the time the White House knew that the speech was there, I would be on my way back to Washington from Philadelphia. Um, but I also knew that um, what was going to happen was unpredictable because I was going to be violating uh, our protocol. Uh, but I had decided that uh, it would be much easier for me to ask for forgiveness <laughs> than to ask for permission. <laughs> I didn't want to be put in the position of being told uh, asked by the chief of staff or the president not to give that that speech. And so uh, I knew that by the end of the day on Wednesday, I might possibly be on a plane back to Atlanta. And so I, I didn't know, but I felt so strongly. I said that if I have any credibility as secretary, uh, I have to really do everything I can to protect and promote the health of Americans. And this is a blatant effort that really goes in the opposite direction. Well, to make a long story short, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I never got a call uh, for, from the White House. I did learn later that the lobbyists for the tobacco industry called the White House. They were enraged by the speech I made. John Sununu, our chief of staff, uh, told the, the lobbyists, well, I'll speak with the president as you want me to do, but I can't guarantee you what the out, outcome will, will be. Uh, so he spoke to the president, and the only thing I ever heard was about 10 days later at a cabinet meeting, before the meeting began, President Bush said, Lou, we're noticing you speaking about uh, tobacco, and we're behind you, we may be a little bit too far behind you, but we're behind you. Wow. That was it. So, so that was um, it, because I felt that um, 
to be honest with the American public, my position would be to promote those activities that were to lead to healthy behavior and protecting the health of, of Americans. Same you know, with, with that nations, et, et cetera. So the, the consequence of, of my no, uh, speaking out was that speech was 18 minutes that day. Um, there were um, three minutes devoted to my condemning R.J. Reynolds for their plans to introduce Uptown. Uh, the 15 minutes was about the benefits to our society of having this research facility uh, adding to the capability of that research center developing uh, new, new, new knowledge. So, so that was uh, that. That was it. So I, I never received a reprimand uh, or anything like that. It was casual comment, which in essence the president was telling me you you did okay, but but he wasn't. That was as close as he was going to get, because we knew the tobacco industry worked to have people sympathetic to their industry working as White House staff to really try and avoid things such as the speech that I gave in, in Philadelphia. You know, that's a, a terrific uh, context that you've put this in. I, it just reminded me that uh, Karl Rove, the Republican strategist of that era, was uh, a, an executive of Philip Morris. When he was not in Washington, he'd go back to Philip Morris, and then he'd come back to D.C. to get some government uh, role. But uh, that gave you a sense of the revolving door between the tobacco industry and the federal government. The uh, and this is under both uh, parties, by the way. It's not unique to uh, mm -hmm. Republicans. Um, it's funny. I, you also reminded me contemporaneous with your, uh, I think, remarkable uh, effort, because it 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 really brought attention not only to Jesse Brown's uh, work, but to saying we're not going to take this anymore. I think it really startled not just the tobacco industry, but also individuals like Benjamin Hooks. Uh, cause one of the recordings, one of, I think it's maybe the best item on our whole website is sad to say a recording that was sent to me, uh, that someone had made at an NAACP meeting where Benjamin Hooks was, uh, the longtime, uh, uh, executive director. And he introduced the Spingarden Award, uh, dinner, uh, with, uh, this glowing praise of George Knox, who was the, head of uh, a vice president for minority, uh, well, I call it minority marketing, but it was minority affairs for Philip Morris. And uh, he actually challenged the world and said, people ask me, why do we take money from Philip Morris? We're, we're, we're proud to take that money. And why don't they go to Time Magazine or all those other organizations and ask why don't they stop taking them? Why do they always pick on us, the minorities? Which I thought was a very good point. But nonetheless, I think it shook up a lot of people at the Urban League, at the NACP, and uh, La Raza, and other minority organizations, and the United Negro College Fund that had been openly uh, taking uh, tobacco industry money. And then you also, I sent to your wonderful uh, communications director, Gail Converse, the headline from the Atlanta Journal of you holding up, uh, well, actually, it was one of our t-shirts, Throw Tobacco Out of Sports, and calling for the industry to get out of sports and calling for sports bodies to reject their funding. And we're going to put that with this interview. Uh, but what, what uh, sparked that? Because, uh, that I think really, uh, opened the floodgates. I think along with, uh, Congressman Waxman, you were the most outspoken on tobacco sponsorship of sports. Well, I wanted to do everything I could to bring attention of the American public to the adverse effects of tobacco on health, knowing that that the percentage of deaths and illness uh, in the African American community uh, on a per capita basis was higher in the African American uh, community. Uh, and so I wanted to do everything I could using the office of the secretary to get that message uh, to the public. And there were leaders in the black community uh, who, with whom I worked, one of them was um, uh, the late Reverend Calvin Butts, who was minister of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York. And during the time I was secretary, he would lead uh, groups um, uh, in Harlem 
uh, that would uh, uh, plaster over or whitewash these uh, uh, advertising uh, signs uh, on walls in the black community and urge the confectionaries to take the ads uh, that were in the windows of their shops at uh, out because he was um, trying to improve the health of the community as, as, as well. And one of the things, um, and this happened before the Uptown incident, uh, when he uh, was doing this, an article appeared in the New York Times, and I called him, and I knew him because uh, Calvin Butts was also a graduate of Morehouse College. So I had met him at college events. So I called him and said, Calvin, you didn't get this call, but I just want you to know you're doing a great job. <laughs> so he was there was a lot of support from him and other people like him. So that so this has divided uh, the minority community uh, because there are those in the community who are concerned and who are trying to uh, decrease tobacco use. Uh, but unfortunately, there's still too many organizations and people uh, who are accepting money. Uh, and to me, that's really undermining uh, the, the efforts. And by the way, the uh, net result of that Uptown speech that I gave was that two weeks later, I received a letter from the president of R.J. Reynolds informing me that they were not proceeding uh, with the introduction of this new cigarette. So that was the end of Uptowns. So I felt very good about that. I think it was an important thing. I, I, I've talked to Jesse Brown and I've, I've said it, it, it was really a miraculous effort. It was well supported uh, by a lot of people. Of course, Reynolds then came back and introduced another brand which they called Salem Box, uh, with almost the same kind of different colors. By the way, we created a brand, uh, to spoof Uptown. We called it Upchuck. And, and we had a, I'll have to send you the pack that we designed, mm -hmm. uh, with our artist, Doug Minkler. Uh, but, uh, I think ridicule is another approach. And that's what we've, we've done through the years of, of making fun. We called it the Emphysema Slims Tennis Tournament instead of Virginia Slims. <laughs> and but then you you um, but I, I I think that the the issue is that the, the response of the tobacco companies, particularly the the head of Philip Morris at the time, George Weissman, was that uh, people like me and you were kooks. They actually called us kooks and fanatics, and um, they they said Weissman actually said um, we don't we don't target uh, minorities. We target everyone. He literally said, we target everyone. And, and I think in a way, uh, whether that's a Freudian slip, but he, he said, no, we don't discriminate. We go after all we can who are adults that we want them to smoke our products. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a, um, it's an interesting issue. But going on to sports, um, did you meet with any, uh, opposition? You know, the, there was a program called Yes Minister on British TV. And there was one episode called the, uh, the smoke screen. And it showed how the prime minister, who didn't care about smoking, was able to get his tax cut by um, by by supporting the health minister who wanted to ban cigarette advertising. And also he got the support of the sports minister who wanted to get more tobacco funding of sports. And he, it's a funny kind of an episode, uh, but it shows you that the health minister was not as powerful as the sports minister because they just love that British American tobacco money. But clearly... Mm -hmm. You must have gotten pushback from uh, NASCAR and and uh, the women's tennis tour and um, other sports where the title sponsor, Winston Cup Racing or Marlboro Cup, was the actual tobacco company. Yes, the, 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 this would be uh, in the form of uh, comments uh, uh, ridiculing these, these efforts. Um, and first of all, trying to question the science, question the basis uh, for this, but also uh, uh, qu questioning uh, the um, fact that they we're trying to make the point that we were stepping on the rights of Americans to, to make their own choice, because they would always say that we're not asking uh, teenagers to smoke. We think smoking is an adult ch 
choice. Uh, and so that's uh, the market that, that we shoot, shoot for when so much data shows the kinds of things they put in their ads would be attractive to teenagers, uh, et, et cetera. And it so happens that a high school classmate of mine ended up working for the, for Philip Morris. Uh, and he ended up, um, uh, working in the White House. Uh, and the sad, uh, story with him. You're not well, talking about Stanley S. Scott, are you? Stanley Scott, yes. Yes. Right. I, 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 that's an amazing individual. Right. You know, he was, you know, prominent family here in Atlanta. The credit Scott King him, was uh, and his family. He really, <clears throat> and also he had, pro he volunteered to get funding for us as well. And I told him, Stan, no, we, really uh are not interested but we don't want that 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 we want funds but we want funds that are really not impaired uh, by um, being profits from the deaths or the illness of, of of people so unfortunately as you know stan developed lung cancer and died uh, from it i have to tell you a little story because uh in 1986 after i've been fired by the New York State Journal of Medicine and it was pretty much floundering uh, looking for another position. Uh, I got a call from the Washington Post asking if I would uh, write uh, about the targeting of minorities by the tobacco industry for their Sunday uh, viewpoint section. And I, I worked on this, handed what I thought was a really good uh, commentary. And the editor called me back. He says, no, you didn't, you didn't get uh, the response from Philip Morris. I said, what do you mean? You mean I have to call up the tobacco companies and ask for their response? He says, yeah, you got to do that. Hmm. So I, I had to call Stanley S. Scott, who I recognized was the, the vice president for minority affairs at Philip Morris. And I remember the, the, the hearing the, the silence at the other end of the line when he got on the phone and he said, is this Dr. Alan Blum, the anti-smoking activist? Hmm. I said, well, Mr. Scott, you could call me that, but I think for the purposes of this interview, I have to be a journalist asking for your comments on this. Well, within about 15 minutes, he was inviting me to dinner. We mm -hmm. talked about our common relationships because, as I mentioned, my uncles were very involved with uh, Credit Scott King's family and they were patients. She, her kids were patients of my uncle and so forth. And uh, of course, I knew the Atlanta Daily World, which I read when I was in Atlanta at medical school, the, the, one of the foremost newspapers. And uh, we just talked and I asked him about his service for President Nixon and the fact that uh, under Nixon, people don't realize this, uh, more minority physicians gained access to medical school positions than under any other administration mm -hmm. through, the, right. through the legislation that, that Stanley S. Scott helped to guide under Nixon. I mean, so you give people credit, but the sad ending of this story is uh, although I didn't take him up on his offer to have dinner, I was invited to speak, uh, uh, I guess about 20 years ago at the uh, LSU Comprehensive Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. And as I walked in a couple of hours earlier, I saw over the top Stanley S. Scott Comprehensive Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. And I went in and I asked the person who was head of the center, I said, by the way, do you know who Stanley S. Scott was? Mm -hmm. And he says, sure, he ran the Miller Beer distributorship here. I said, well, <laughs> he had been a vice president for a cigarette company. Miller Beer was owned by that cigarette company. And he mm -hmm. said, please don't mention that. Don't mention that during the talk. <laughs> but I, I thought it was, I thought I, I had a lot of respect for, for Stanley Scott. And, and I did not know that he was someone that was a classmate. Yes, right. And his family is very prominent here in Atlanta. Yes. Because, um, uh, he was a journalist. He, I'm sorry. He, he was a journalist, basically, too. Oh, no, yes. Yes. But, uh, there, um, there was, um, an organization called the Hungry Club here in Atlanta. In those years, blacks were not, um, uh, given membership in the Rotary Club. So the Butler Street YMCA had this group that was formed uh, in the black community called the Hungry Club. And so they would speak. And so Stanley's dad was the owner of the Atlanta Daily World uh, and would speak. So uh, Stanley and, and his father and his family, they were very staunch Republicans. Uh, but 
they were working uh, with the Democrats, black Democrats, really for the same purpose. So that they're really re repealing the white primary here in Georgia, where if you were African American, you couldn't vote in the primaries. You could vote in the main e e election, mm. but you couldn't vote in the uh, election to to select the candidates for e each party. So, so they fought uh, that. So I knew Stanley and his family uh, very well, and of course when he became a White House staffer, uh, we you know, you know were very excited for him. But um, uh, we had that disagreement. We remained friends, uh, but um, uh, that was one time that he offered to be helpful. But we really couldn't couldn't accept that. Yeah. I would be remiss in not acknowledging some of the individuals that you've alluded to um your wife as i calculated it in 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 the, the bio that i read uh I, and i haven't read your, your autobiography but i i did read a, a lot about you you've been married if i'm not mistaken to uh ginger williamson uh, for 68 years that's correct right could, could you share a little bit more about about her well yes well that was um a very um, interesting uh, event, the way that happened. You met at Morehouse, was that correct? Uh, I met uh, in my first year in medical school. Oh. Uh, when I went to um, to Boston, that was my first time living in a non-segregated environment. It's 1954, which also was the year of Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court decision. So um, at Boston U University, uh, two blocks away was a female dormitory called the Franklin Square House. Ginger had come down to Boston from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in the western part of the state, uh, to attend Northeastern University. And so I was introduced um, by a fraternity brother I had met there in Boston. Uh, who was tr trying to help me uh, acclimatize to my new surroundings. And so I met Ginger, she was a great tennis player and uh, we really um, uh, hit it off. Uh, I didn't have much money uh, so that we would walk along the Charles River uh, for dates. And I had sung in the Morehouse College Glee Club because Morehouse has always had an outstanding choir. Uh, so um, I would sing along uh, Glee Club songs. And so um, that worked. <laughs> so we got married my next year, my, my sophomore year in medical school. And um, so we've been together all these years and I have three children, all of them bo born in Boston. They're of course now grown ups, uh, but um, uh, we um, uh, have really had a great life together. And I also should mention that the things I've been able to accomplish, she deserves a lot of credit for it because she is the glue for our family. And while I was busy down at Boston City Hospital or at BU Medical School, uh, she would be taking care of the family uh, and doing all of those things. So, and, and, and she also worked uh, during my internship. And so she helped bring in funds for the family as well. So, so she's been a true partner all these years. Thank you for sharing. I, I had two questions about your Boston years. Now you talk about a, a non-segregated environment, but Boston was known notoriously for the, the violence shown toward uh, African-Americans during the era of uh, busing and and other issues I, I i don't think it gets off the hook uh for as being a, a, a quote non-segregated environment well no it's interesting um you're speaking of the era of louise day hicks yes. who was a boston city council person uh, she came to power in the late 50s when they were promoting bus busing uh to integrate the, the schools and, and of course, she lived in South Boston, and she actually was quite successful in 
uh, generating a lot of opposition. Uh, so that uh, it was interesting that in I ended medical school in September of 54, was well received there at BU and in Boston, uh, finding a place to rent. But by, by the late 50s, uh, the tensions in Boston had developed quite dramatically so that someone entering Boston, going to Boston in the late 50s had a very different experience than someone in the mid 50s. When I went, for example, with all of the history of Boston, with the, with the American Revolution and the Tea Parties and the uh, shootings at uh, the Concord Bridge uh, and the Lexington Minutemen and Paul Revere, I really uh, was very interested in that history, things I had read about or been taught about. Uh, so I really took, took the tour of Boston, also the various cultural uh, organizations, the museums, uh, the, the symphony, uh, all of the universities, uh, the beautiful river uh, b between Boston and, and Cambridge. So for me, it was a very um, pleasant experience, but then became very different later on. And it, I ended up on the faculty at Boston University. Uh, and I know that in 1968, when King was assassinated, I was um, assistant professor at the medical school. And several of us worked to, to recruit more black students, not only to Boston University, but to Harvard and Tufts, Dartmouth, Vermont, uh, UMass, because uh, when King was assassinated, uh, we all looked at our universities or our medical schools and saw that we had very few uh, blacks. And, and the reaction we had, and of course this was similar to the rest of the universities and around the country, uh, that the King's work, we took up. And so we worked very hard, but we ran into um, these, uh, uh, this problem because of the tensions that had been generated by the busing controversy there in, in, in Boston. So it was really very un un unfortunate. And um, uh, today we're going through a similar phase uh, uh, with the resistance uh, now. Uh, so it's unfortunate. But because I, I say that we have made, in the same way that we have made progress in reducing tobacco use, but we still have uh, more to achieve to improve the health of Americans. The same uh, with uh, divisions within our society. Uh, not only in, in those years, the minority community was the African American community. Today, the minority community includes not only African Americans, but Latinos. Native Americans uh, and other immigrants. And I find it unfortunate and ironic and uh, frankly, uh, to me, uh, a conflict in our value system to see the very strong anti-immigrant uh, uh, feelings in our community. I certainly agree that we need to do better in terms of the integrity of our borders, but some of the measures that are being used, I, I really find as an American really objectionable because all of these individuals are human. And the only uh, group here in America in our diverse society that you could say are the true Native Americans are the uh, American Indians. All of us came from so, somewhere else. We've all learned to live together. So I'm hoping that we can get through this period and maintain our value system because what we profess to believe in is very encouraging, very inspiring, but sometimes in the execution uh, or living up to it, uh, we fall short. And so as an American, I really want to do everything I can, not only to improve the health of Americans, but the level of education uh, and the quality of life that we enjoy. So hopefully we will reach that goal at some time in the future. You know, listening to you, it reminds me of Charles Blow 
of the New York Times and his columns describing his upbringing in Louisiana, the same, uh, in the very same neighborhood as the current uh, Speaker of the House and uh, his contrasting viewpoints and describing uh, the, the relative difficulties that someone uh, of a minority population faces compared to those who have traditionally been entitled. And another individual that uh, I'll send you the link to is my colleague, Dr. Sal Mangione, who has written widely about uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who was the ultimate uh, odd person out, who was uh, literally uh, uh, a uh, an illegitimate child a a uh, he was left-handed in a time where you could only be a right-hander to get anywhere he was uh, gay he was uh, uh really um as far outside the mainstream as you could get and and perhaps the most creative and accomplished individual who ever lived was that person uh i, I just want to as we begin to wrap it up i just want to mention again how much i appreciate your tribute to your own family doctor growing up, Dr. Joseph Griffin, and and to your dad and to your mom in in rural Georgia, and and what they did for you, and to the high school teachers, because I really fear that we're not appreciating the most important people, the most important occupation, uh, high school and grade school teachers, and you brought that out so beautifully. Well, I really. Have, was very fortunate that I had great role models growing up, starting with my parents, um, because um, uh, my father, when we moved from Atlanta to Blakely, really brought suit against the school system because it was separate but not equal. For example, the white high school had a band with instruments. There was no band at the black school. The, the white school had a library the black school uh, didn't, et cetera. So, so he worked against that. And so as a result of that, he had difficulty living uh, there. And actually, uh, he, someone shot my, my father. They tried to kill him. He survived uh, uh, that, but uh, that was um, the, the experience. But, but they sent my brother and me back to Atlanta when I was in fifth, starting in, in fifth grade, my brother in sixth grade, so that we would get a better education. And so in Atlanta, we were exposed uh, not only to the faculty of the black colleges here in Atlanta, but also to the bis black businessmen, uh, doctors, others. But in Southwest Georgia, there was one black physician, you alluded to Dr. Joseph Griffin, he was someone I totally admired because he had skills that no one else had. He could treat people who were sick and cure them, make them well. He also treated his patients with respect. Whereas um, when we had two uh, doctors in Blakely, white, and when you went to see them, you'd have to go around back through a separate entrance to wait until he had taken care of all of the white patients. Uh, and you, uh, the, his patients who were black would always be addressed by their first name, be John or Mary, rather than Mr. Johnson or Mrs. Smith, et cetera. And we noticed that, and we res resented that, because of all of these very blatant uh, signals trying to say that you are less worthy, et, et cetera. So Dr. Griffin, because of his skills and also because he treated his patients with respect, uh, I admired, and he was very successful. So when I was, by the time I was age five, I was very clear I wanted to be a doctor. So he was my first uh, professional role model. And as you mentioned, my teachers uh, in school, I admired also, and my mother was a teacher as, as, as well. And so I love learning, uh, and I was always curious about the factors, why, how do trees grow, or birds sing, or why do waves occur at the beach, etc. Things like like that that um, we would talk about. So, so I always lo loved learning, and so I really had people who encouraged me all along, and of course my experience 
at Morehouse College uh, was, um, again, reinforcing uh, the president of the college, Dr. Benjamin Mays, really, who inspired all of us. And of course, he was a role model for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, did you they, did you know Dr. King in Boston? Did you ever run into him when he was in Boston? No, no it was it, very interesting. We, I never did. Um, I went to Boston in 1954. He was there at the School of Religion, uh, and I believe he left in 1956 uh, uh, to go to Alabama. Uh, so I did not know him, but I heard about him, but I met him later in 1963 uh, when he visited. And my wife and I attended Christ Church there in the Cambridge Common. And so he visited there, and that's when he made his speech about bringing peace to Vietnam. Uh, and Which he was reviled for. Oh, I know. It, 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 it was. So, so he was a truly remarkable person. And then later, of course, when he was assassinated in April of 68, uh, we had the reaction at the medical school that I mentioned. And we brought in many more black students, not only at Boston University, but at Harvard, Tufts, um, Dartmouth, uh, UMass as, as well, because we took uh, the work that King was trying to accomplish as our own work as a result of his leadership. That summer uh, of 68, when I was taking organic chemistry at, uh, at Emory, I didn't think I could pass it at Amherst College where I was a student. Uh, I, I paid my respects by attending services at Ebenezer Baptist Church and I met Daddy King and it was one of the greatest experiences of, of, of going to that. I think anyone who who wants to go to a, a, a service that will inspire every time, that is an amazing institution. Mm -hmm. Right. It, the, uh, just it, as we wrap it up, I wanted to ask you just briefly, by the way, I have another connection. Uh, you received an honorary doctorate from Oglethorpe in Atlanta. A lot of people don't know what an incredible institution that is, but my mother, I graduated from Oglethorpe. So uh, I, I just threw that in. Um, right. You know, uh, in 1997, uh, Dr. Uh, Coop uh, called me uh, when uh, he was, he had been asked, uh, he said, keep this under your hat. He said, I've been asked, uh, this is as the state attorney generals were suing the tobacco industry uh, for all the damage that they'd done to health and, and they were aiming to get billions and billions. And he said, I, I think they're going to reach a settlement. And um, they've asked me to be the master of the funding that is going to come from this industry. Part of it will be going to fight smoking. And they're going to be giving us a few billion dollars. Uh, and he said, uh, they're going to have me running the books and overseeing this. And I said, wow. He says, I'm calling you because I said I will do this under only one condition that the first $100 million goes toward rebuilding the National Health Museum on the Mall in Washington, <laughs> and of which $10 million will go to you, Dr. Blum, to direct the tobacco component of the museum. He says, mm -hmm. don't tell anyone, but keep your fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Well, I had reservations about that whole deal anyway, mm -hmm. because I would rather have seen some of these tobacco executives go to prison rather than just getting money. But you know, mm -hmm. I, I had to, I said, wow, that there'll be something if we could build this museum. And yes. then, of course, that fell through when Senator McCain jacked up the price and they voted against this agreement. The next year, a much more, a much weaker agreement was agreed to. And yes. they did get some money, but that went to somebody else. And that started the American Legacy Foundation, which mm -hmm. I personally think they squandered a lot of that money and didn't really do what you know, only 2% of that money goes to fight smoking today, by the way, that, that was given to the states under the Master Settlement Agreement. But you have a passion all these years with Dr. Coop uh, for the, the, the revival of the National Health Museum. I should add that there is the National Museum of Health and Medicine, which right. is the military medicine museum that's out now. They've got a beautiful new building in mm -hmm. Bethesda. But uh, uh, that Adrian Noe, the remarkable director, has been there for over 30 years. But it's been a, a, a must have been a real difficult time to try to see us not getting this museum, which uh, I, I have been hoping 
uh, is there any chance that even a virtual national health museum might get uh, get us off the ground or well i would love to see that um but we really um had a difficult time and and of course um uh while i really am pleased with the things that we have accomplished the national health museum is one of those things that we were not successful in in developing uh and i found that it was difficult to explain the concept to people in such a way that they understood uh why this was important and what we were try trying to do because here we were trying to give people information as to what is a healthy lifestyle what is the value of exercise uh how does diet influence one what what about sunlight uh what about allergens um medical checkups it 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 etc and of course uh trying to and of course chick coop had started the whole concept of the, of the national health M museum so trying to explain this and then finding trying to find land uh, the, because as you probably know we had hoped to put this on the mall there in in washington but could never find land for, for it and then i became involved uh and uh we uh then decided to to look around the country and see if there would be another site for it uh so we were not successful with with that and so this was one of those things that we finally reluctantly said that this is something that whose time is not yet here but hopefully will come so i would love to to see it uh, but this is something i think for the next generation to develop well on a, a more hopeful note i will just uh, continue to keep the pilot light lit for this because i think these days of virtual media just as we're we're speaking now through zoom i think that uh, there is especially in this era of 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 disinformation of of hate of of ai remaking history of vaccine uh lunacy uh it's it's a national health museum with a name attached such as yours and others in the health field would would mean a lot it would really counteract this age of disinformation and so i'll hold out hope for this and hope we can merge our tobacco website into it but uh it's it's a uh, it's a sad thing that we're we're seeing so much disinformation we're seeing infectious diseases that we thought we had eradicated reemerging we're seeing vaccine rates in mississippi which had the best vaccination program more exemptions now are being given for vaccines now in mississippi i think than any other state it's gone mm -hmm. from having the best vaccination program heading toward one of the worst mm -hmm. so we yeah. have our work cut out for us but i i i i hope that you'll have this hope that maybe we could revive this idea and uh i i would love to see this uh as capping uh, your remarkable career right I well just, thank you very much i would love to see see that because i think it would do so much i because i often say that a uh healthy nation is a wealthy nation that is if you have a healthy population they can be more productive uh in innovation developing goods and services uh and wealth in the community and independence i hear so that it really goes beyond health but it goes to the fiber of the nation it, itself so this would have many benefits uh so uh, that i would be happy to join with anyone to really try and make that happen it, it's sort of sad that the cdc museum uh I, I i had i've had some concerns uh they had invited me to have an exhibition when they opened uh but it was it was literally blocked uh i still don't know the exact uh it was called cartoonist take up smoking it wound up going to the national museum of health and medicine uh for a full year and adrian kept extending it but um uh it it uh, the cdc saw it and they somebody wrote and said why don't we have it here in atlanta and uh part of it was because a lot of the cartoons made fun of people like Jesse Helms mm. and Bob Dole who did not uh, believe that the tobacco issue was an important one but in, in any event i i think that uh, an independent national health museum that uh, would 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 really be something i i watched these commercials today for Keytruda 
And, and I, I wonder why are these being advertised? A uh, $150,000 a year drug being advertised to the general public. I, I don't understand this. They could be taking that kind of money uh, to, to really help educate people how to prevent cancer. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, we're still, we're still not there yet, Dr. Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And, and right. please, uh, I hope you'll continue to lend your voice uh, to getting better education for people on prevention and not just treatment after the fact. Well, I certainly intend to do everything I can uh, uh, to improve the health of Americans because um, I see this as a dual calling. I feel very good when we're able to uh, help educate the, the public uh, or I could write something that would be of value. So indeed, um, I'd be very happy to, to be involved. You haven't missed a beat and you haven't skipped a step. I, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time and for Gail Converse to help arrange this. And and best wishes uh, for everything you do for Morehouse and, and for health in America. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure talking with you.